Hello, I'm Earl Lewis, and I want to welcome you to another episode of The Merging Point, where social justice meets social solutions, the official podcast of the Center for Social Solutions. Today, we'll be discussing The Walls Around Opportunity, a book written by our guest, Professor Gary Orfield, and is a part of the book series, Our Compelling Interest, which is published by Princeton University Press. This ongoing book series, supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, aims to highlight how diversity enhances and supports our democracy. In the walls around opportunity, Orfield paints a troubling portrait of American higher education, explaining how profound racial gaps embedded in virtually every stage of our children's lives pose a major threat to communities of color and, by a greater extension, the nation. He describes how the 1960s and early 1970s uh, were the only period in history to witness sustained efforts at racial e equity in higher education, and how during the Reagan era and after, they, we ushered in a more new set of colorblind policies, which ignored the realities of color inequality. Orfield shows how this misguided policy has resegregated public schools, exacerbated inequalities in college preparation, denied needed financial aid to families, and led to huge price increases over decades where we've seen little real gain in income for most Americans. Drawn on a wealth of new data and featuring commentaries by Stella Flores and James Anderson, this timely and urgent book shows how colorblind policies serve only to raise the walls of segregation higher and proposes real solutions that can make higher education available to all. So it's my pleasure to begin to introduce Gary Orfield. Orfield is a distinguished research professor of education, law, political science, and urban planning at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. His research interests are in the study of civil rights, education policy, urban policy, and minority opportunity. He was co-founder and director of the Harvard Civil Rights Project and now serves as co-director of the Civil Rights Project at UCLA. His central interest has been the development and implementation of social policy, particularly the impact of policy on equal opportunity for success in American society. Today's conversation will explore higher education, past, present, and future regarding racialized admissions policies. This includes affirmative actions overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court and what universities can and should do to continue increasing diversity on campuses nationwide. Gary, welcome. Great to be with you, Earl. We've given an overview of the walls around opportunity, but how would you describe the book? Well, it's an effort to look at the puzzle that we have of having the world's greatest higher education system and it seems unable to deal with issues of equity in a very unequal society. Um, and to think about the degree to which you need to explicitly consider the racial polarization of the country in designing policy for higher education if we're going to make it come out differently. And so if there were one message you would want readers to take away, what is that one message? In a society that has always been organized around race and ethnicity, uh, thinking you can run higher education institutions without considering that explicitly is becoming a, a passive part of a system of intergenerational inequality. That you have to think about the nature of the society when you're thinking about higher education, admissions, successes, and the connection with the public education that comes before higher education. And if you don't think about that, um, either explicitly or with a rich contextual understanding of what its realities are, you're almost inevitably going to be perpetuating inequality. For much of the last quarter of a century, if not half a century, there's been this allusion to colorblindness. And your book takes this on. So when we talk about colorblind policies in higher education, what do these policies look like in practice? Well, colorblind policies basically look as if we're a different society than we are, that we're a society where everybody has a reasonable chance to be prepared for college. There's an even equal distribution of resources of families and 
communities and that if the colleges uh, simply do what they'd like to do and look for people that will be most successful in their in their uh, campuses and in their classes as soon as they arrive we're going to get a system that perpetuates really deep inequality and it's not going to prepare us for the society that we have coming along inequality color blindness law I mean, think back on your own expertise that involves political science and look at the law. And if we look at the legal and policy landscape, uh, particularly surrounding affirmative action, higher education, what do you believe is the future? Well, um, the Harvard Unite and University of North Carolina decision last, last year was a body blow to 50 years of efforts, limited though they were, by the selective institutions in the country to maintain some kind of level of diversity in their student body, in their faculty, in their campus communities. And to have an institution that reflected the, somewhat of the, the complexity of our society. Um, what we've been going through um, in reaching a very important point last year with the, with the Supreme Court decision is simply denial. Beginning in the, uh, in the 70s and reaching an intense period in the 1980s, we've been acting as if we're a different society where people say, we, well, we used to have a racial problem, but we don't really anymore. We solved that with civil rights. And maybe we've just gone too far. Maybe we are discriminating against whites and Asians in our society. Um, it's essentially a movement that ignores the data that those of us who work on higher education and look at it statistically see every day that we have not gotten there. Um, that we're going backwards in important ways, that families don't have the same resources. Um, that are the schools and the preparation to college is very systematically unequal. And if we are going to be colorblind in a society that's organized around race, we're just going to be blind. You titled your book, The Walls Around Opportunity. Help our listeners understand what you mean by the walls around opportunity. The reason that I chose that title was because people who are engaged in the debate over higher education access have tended to focus on admissions. And affirmative action is basically about recruitment and admissions. And that's only part of the puzzle. Affirmative action only ever affected substantially, at the very most, 20% of the colleges in the country. Because most of our colleges aren't very selective and really did not have very much in the way of affirmative action policies. But all of our colleges are affected by other walls that aren't admissions walls. They're, admi they're the cost walls and they're the preparation walls. And these have to be addressed whether or not we have affirmative action because they are scandalously unequal. We're one of the most unequal societies in the world in terms of our economic status. And in terms of our costs of college, we're one of the highest. Um, and our financial aid system is very imperfect and has declined. Our basic financial aid is a federal Pell Grant. Uh, that's declined you know, cataclysmically since its peak in the 1970s when it made it really possible to go to a four-year public institution. Um, without incurring tremendous debt, and now it pays for only about a third of the costs of that. Um, we simply don't have an adequate system of financial support for students to go to college and make a choice about going to college. Uh, we have to think about this very, very seriously. Given your work on the Civil Rights Project and the research that you've undertaken, and given what you see uh, in California, are there examples where policymakers, administrators, et cetera, are beginning to think about the implications of the walls? 
I think a lot of people in higher education know that these kinds of things exist. They just don't have any tools to really deal with them. And, you know, tragically, both the researchers and the administrators of our public schools and colleges tend to operate as if these two things weren't connected, that you, that you can think about one of these systems by itself without thinking about the other. Um, we think about that in that way, I think, because most of the people who do this work and most of the people who run these institutions have their own children in schools that have a default path to college, that have connections to college, that have a, a, a set of courses and requirements and preparation that lead to a, a reasonable preparation for a good college. Uh, they don't really think about the fact that that doesn't exist for other people. And they really don't have tools in a conservative period in our society uh, to address it in any case. It's many of our colleges are just struggling to continue on the way that they've been going and figuring out how to meet their bills and deal with deferred maintenance. And uh, for our private colleges, many of them are trying to figure out how to survive. So very few of them really have had the resources and the focus to address the financial needs. And most of them have almost no relationship with the debate over preparation in the high schools, which is mostly dominated by federal and state policy that focuses mostly on the early grades and preschools. As you think about preparation, and look around the country. Are there examples of schools in either California or elsewhere where uh, preparation solutions are ones you would actually support? Well, I think one of the encouraging things is that, um, you know, we had a terrible dropout problem that was almost completely covered up by bad statistics that we and others started working on very, very strongly around 2000. Uh, we've dealt with a lot of the dropout uh, inequality. The, the high school completion rates have gone way up. We haven't really dealt with college preparation very seriously. We, we've raised the course requirements mostly in science and math, uh, but they haven't as very much moved the outcomes. We've got more course taking, but with, without much gain in terms of knowledge. Um, and we have not really addressed other parts of the process. For example, if you are going to go to a college that's a reasonably competitive, strong four-year college, you need to know how to write. You need to know how to uh, think analytically. You need to know how to do at least simple research, unless you're going to be at a tremendous disadvantage to people who've been to good uh, preparation. Even when you have a strong focus in, in high schools um, in terms of getting test scores up, you often don't have um, the kind of setting in these high schools that leads to getting those basic pre-collegiate skills. I think it's very important that we have a discussion about that in the country. This isn't about test scores. This is about basic skills you need to succeed in higher education. And uh, these are very relevant life skills for, for many, many parts of later life. We were talking a few minutes ago about the Supreme Court decision. And so one of the walls you identified is the emissions wall. What are our options there? I mean, the test stops, you know, movement has gained some momentum, although with Dartmouth's recent announcement, there may be at the beginnings of a reversal. Is it only about testing or are there other things we need to do? No, it's not, a, it's not only about testing. Uh, testing is something that is important, but any system you use that ranks the students is likely to reflect advantages. So if you look at who, who has been active for example, who has been active in different kinds of functions and sports. Those are going to be people disproportionately whose families have resources to help them have those opportunities. It's very notorious in some of our sports. You know, if you look at fencing or horseback riding or many things like that, but 
some colleges operate, the sailing teams. Um, those are things that are class related. Uh, many kinds of preparations in music and arts and many other fields are related to the, your family's resources. Uh, so we need to think about admissions uh, in a variety of ways. Um, one of the ways is never to use testing as a way that the tests were never designed to serve in the first place. The testing industry itself says you should never make a decision just on the basis of one test. Uh, many colleges have done that for many years. Uh, that's really important. You need to look for variables and things that aren't related um, to differential opportunity, like things like um, creativity. Um, now, if you look at that as in terms of accomplishments that depend on having had resources to take art lessons and so forth, that's one thing. But, you know, uh, for example, the, uh, um, the Puente Foundation has selected students on the basis of pizzazz, organizing ability, things like that. We need to look at things like that because we're looking for people who are going to, the colleges are looking for people who not only are going to do well in their initial courses, which we can identify reasonably well by looking at grades and tests, but people who really make a difference in their lives, which is a very, very different thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different thing. And we need to think much more broadly about those kinds of things to look at. We need to have more uh, like a default into higher education, four-year college education than a default out. We need to have pre-guaranteed financial aid it's notified automatically to students whose families are already documented as being in poverty, for example, uh, having their family on housing assistance. Uh, we need to think creatively about um, how to undo the stratification that the students have grown up in and to identify those kids who might have the, the commitment and, and capacity to get through what's a difficult transition from unequal preparation to realization of opportunity on campus. Uh, we need for colleges to take more chances with students uh, to give their admissions folks more discretion in looking at a student and saying, you know, this kid is unusual in lots of ways um, that don't aren't reflected in his test scores, but people who, who, are, who are around him who know him or her and know that they've got a spark. We need to be able to take chances on people like that. And we need for our admissions processes to have goals for diversity. There's nothing illegal about that. And to think about many ways they can realize it. There's no really good proxy for race, but there are things that are worth looking at. If you look at families that have a different home language, for example, you can identify a lot of students um, who you might not get in a test score. In fact, they might be disadvantaged in their test scores because they're taking them in their second language. Uh, if you look at, um, uh, you know, if you look at uh, kids who have actually gone out and done some political work, you know, done some community work. Um, that's something that's really worth looking at and really worth recognizing. Well, as we begin to draw to a conclusion this afternoon, let me ask you one final question. You write a book, uh, it's received, and then events happen around the world uh, and in the side of the United States. Um, is there anything you wish you could have added uh, to uh, the book, including the paperback edition of the book that is about to come out uh, as you reflect on the walls around opportunity. Well, the book was written with the expectation that the Supreme Court was going to do something very destructive to affirmative action. Um, so it described affirmative action briefly, but it mainly talked about the reality of racial inequality and the walls, the way the multiple walls around college perpetuate that inequality and about all of the different ways you can address 
all of the many places where students fall out of the process of being prepared for college and succeeding in college. Um, I, after the Supreme Court decision, I wrote an afterword for the paperback edition of the book about the decision itself, talking about how the denial of both precedent and research in the majority of the Supreme Court, six members of the Supreme Court, was staggering. And there's really no hope that as long as these folks are on the Supreme Court that we're going to get a, re a return of affirmative action. We need to start out with that. We need it and we can't have it. Um, so what that means that all of our institutions, our high schools and our colleges, have what I think of as an affirmative obligation to help people through all of these points where people are lost. We need better and much more focused financial aid. We need for our colleges um, to take chances on students um, who they might not normally admit, but some of whom are gonna turn out to be remarkably gifted and make a difference in our society. Uh, we need, in the absence of leadership at the national level, we need leadership everywhere else in our states in terms of recognizing and addressing these, these problems in our colleges, in our high schools. We need to create much better communication between our high schools and colleges and much better um, bridges between them and support systems for those high schools that simply don't have the basic essentials for college preparation using our community colleges and our other institutions to help make up for that. So what I, what I would say now, if I were starting this book all over again is, right now our legal system is in the hands of people who are totally clueless about the, this issue and really think the problem is discrimination against white people or Asians who are doing extremely well in higher education in general. And an inability to imagine and to even to bother to find out about where the majority of our young people in our central cities and our racially changing suburbs actually are and what the chances actually that they actually have. So in the absence of national leadership, we need leadership at all of the other levels. And we need people not to ever give up on this because what we're talking about is life-changing opportunities for individuals, um, extremely important opportunities for communities, and a more viable future in terms of the elites in our country that understand each other and understand something about the ability to operate effectively in a multiracial setting. This is a primary um, challenge for the future of our entire society. Our colleges are very powerful, but right now they're powerfully perpetuating inequality. That won't be changed um, through our legal system. Some of it could be changed through our Congress. It needs to be addressed every place else in the society. Gary Orfield, thank you. Thank you for your leadership and for your continued work uh, to actually ensure that we have both a prosperous and diverse democracy. I wanna thank you all for listening to The Merging Point with our special guest, Professor Gary Orfield. His book, The Walls Around Opportunity, will be available in paperback beginning April 16th of this year. And if you wanna stay updated on all things related to The Merging Point, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to leave a review and share your thoughts. We want to hear from you, our listeners. For exclusive behind the scenes content and update, follow the University of Michigan Center for Social Solutions on X, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thank you again for listening.